Okay. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's the time to start. And uh, so this is our uh, uh, lecture of uh, lecture series, and I'm very you know uh, happy to announce that you know Manu is here. And you know, Manu, you have a very huge fan following here, especially in young researchers. People are crazy here about you. So, okay, so without any, you know, further delay, I would like to introduce Professor Manu Prakash. Professor Manu Prakash is an associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford University and a senior fellow at Stanford Woods Center for the Environment. At Stanford, he runs Prakash Lab, a curiosity-driven research group in the field of physical biology that employs interdisciplinary approaches to understand how computational is embedded in biological matter and is dedicated towards interventing and distributing fungal sciences tools to democratize access to science. Uh, Prakash received a BTEC from IIT Kanpur and a PhD from MIT. He has been the recipient of numerous awards and grants, including MacArthur Fellowship in 2016. He was also a junior fellow of Harvard Society of Fellows and a TED Senior Fellow. Most recently, he received the Unilever Colworth Prize from Microbiology Society. I know this is this is a very brief. I can you know talk about his bio entire day. So uh, I would request Professor Manu Prakash to start his lecture. And at the end of the lecture, we will take uh, you know, some questions. And I request audience to type their questions in the chat box. Over to you, Manu. Uh, thank you so much, Sachin. Uh, I'm assuming, can you all hear me? Yes, perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, it's 9.30 at night here. Uh, I know you're all starting your day. Uh, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here, uh, especially to see uh, many folks connected. Um, you know, I wish uh, we could connect uh, much more in person, but uh, it's still valuable. And I think, again, one of the silver lines of this pandemic personally for me has been uh, to be able to connect back with communities that I've been meaning to touch in base with. So when I got a message from Sachin, uh, it was an absolute delight to actually engage with all of you. Uh, I'll share a brief sets of thoughts and stories uh, with you today. Uh, I think this will be much more of a, of a very broad view of the kinds of technologies we've been developing. But I think what I want you to take away from this is a philosophical approach of building and designing solutions and sharing them rapidly. Uh, if there are questions, please put them in the chat box. I'll try to keep an eye on them. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I also have some time after the talk, so I'm hoping I'll be able to uh, stay a little bit. Uh, so I'm assuming you can see my screen. Uh, and uh, I don't know if many of you can identify the smiling faces and the tool uh, but I'll talk about this tool in the very end. Uh, I'm assuming some of you know about Foldscope uh, and several of the tools that I'll talk about, but I think instead of the technical details of the tools, I want to take you on a journey to tell you why we build these solutions and uh, the methods that we use in sharing them. Uh, so, you know, I titled the talk Frugal Science. So first of all, uh, this is my lab. Uh, I get a chance to work with many young uh, students and postdocs in my lab, and uh, this is a joint effort with them. You can see we are very uh, scattered across the uh, across science in some sense, and I think that also uh, empowers us to really be able to think in a very cross-disciplinary way when the kinds of problems that we're starting to share. Uh, so let me just first define uh, this term that I often use, frugal science. Uh, many of you uh, have thought about this quite deeply. 
I think I think of this uh, in the context of affordability and access. Um, and especially, you know, I know many of us have used the term Jugard and uh, uh, many aspects in our life itself. I often consider frugal science in the context of really thinking about thoughtful solutions. These solutions do require immense amount of effort and science engineering and technology to make them possible. But for the user, they seem uh, seemingly simple. And from a cost perspective, uh, they need to have an orders of magnitude reduction in cost. Sometimes that reduction in cost can come with a performance hit and you get to decide for who you are trying to build and design for. Uh, and again, in the context of healthcare, it's become very clear that uh, the global access and uh, equality of access is fundamentally broken in health sciences. So I think we'll talk quite a lot about that. So this is just my definition of frugal science. Um, uh, many of us uh, do frugal science without sometimes knowing uh, and I think it's valuable to recognize uh, that sometimes solutions come from uh, quite unexpected places. So let me give you an example of the three areas that I'll touch upon. I'll talk quite a lot about health. I will definitely talk about malaria briefly, uh, but I want you to be thinking about both of the context of this talk, but also just much of the work that you all do in a broader perspective. Uh, the same sets of challenges that we face in health and providing health care to people is exactly the same sets of problems we're facing in the environment. And many a times environmental challenges are actually dramatically linked to the health challenges that we see. And COVID is one of the examples of this zoonotic transmission and possibilities of understanding what's happening in our environment. And I want to throw one more challenge in the mix for you. You might not think that for all of us as healthcare researchers, science education uh, may or may not be in our center of attention. Uh, but again, what this pandemic makes us realize is as we fight diseases, we also fight misinformation. And much of that really begins from if we can empower students and kids at a very early stage to be thoughtful leaders and be thinking about science no matter where you grow up. And this is a very important challenge, especially where on one hand, we have incredible advances in science. And on the other hand, we have communities and significant portions of society. It has nothing to do with being well off or not well off, not being able to accept and understand these solutions, such simple solutions as just wearing a mask. So I will weave in aspects of science education and why it's important for us as scientists to not just share our knowledge, but share our methods and our capacity and many of the tools that we use to come to conclusions. And so this will uh, become apparent, but as you're thinking about any problems, you need to be thinking about these three challenges. And I think we'll talk about a few of them. So what I painted is a very broad picture uh, it's quite a challenge because, again, this is not just about India. Every place in the world is suffering. And uh, again, you know, places uh, where many of you focus on malaria, you can think about a significant portion of the world either still is fighting malaria or has a challenge that uh, malaria can rise its head any time if there is any instabilities that arise. And for these types of global challenges, what we really have to think about is global solutions that can scale. I often think of them as a context of measurement tools. You know, diagnostics is a measurement tools, ecological surveillance, many of you who might be involved in mosquito surveillance, it's a measurement challenge. But the second challenge we have to think about is we are only a handful of scientists on this planet and you have to think about a very inclusive environment where you can enable others to be able to take the fruits of your science and bring them to other people. This is not the first time a challenge like that has occurred. And I want to share a brief example. Some of you might know what this object on the left is. Uh, this is uh, Sputnik. This was the very first satellite launched by the Russians. And within 10 years from the moment this object was launched, humans went to the moon. You know, 
many have compared uh, the context of COVID with this moment of Sputnik. Will we be able to rise to this challenge that has been thrown where we realize how fragile our society is? But many a times, many people, what they don't realize is when Sputnik was launched, we had no technologies to track satellites. Anybody, any of us could have said, I've launched a satellite and nobody would know where the satellite is. And a community that was built around that time uh, was what was called Operation Moonwatch. This was the world's largest and the oldest citizen science programs. This was the brainchild of Fred Whipple, a very famous astronomer at Smithsonian, where he empowered communities around the world, tens of thousands of people with very simple $10 telescopes where they looked at the sky and they measured the sky, they compared what they could find, and they collected quantitative data to track every single Russian satellite that was launched after that. And many of the satellites were actually tracked by these individuals. And when you look at right at the center, you realize there is a picture here that says, Mrs. Leloyd Eisenhower, housewife volunteer, sought Sputnik too. And you know, when we think about advancements in science and when we think about communities that are engaged, we have to broaden our perspective for who is the science for and who might we actually recruit in our mission for what we are trying to do. And in my mind, when I look at our healthcare workforce, every single ASHA worker that's actually working in the field, delivering uh, malaria tools, delivering drugs and diagnostics, Every single healthcare worker or all across the world, when Ebola hit, that was a great example of healthcare workers actually uh, being in the trenches, going to the most deadliest of diseases, while we knew very little about the disease and they all they carried are these backpacks. Uh, and to me, these community health workers are the largest citizen science program that still runs. Trillions of dollars are subsidized because of many of these healthcare workers who may or may not have formal education, but they have honed their craft and are eager to learn. So much of the tools that we think about and uh, we want to deliver for many challenges uh, and you know challenges like malaria are thinking about these individuals. I very strongly believe it's technology and humans simultaneously deliver solutions. And what could you put in the backpack of this girl who has a motorbike on this little canoe log in the middle of Liberia? And she's actually headed to a village that has been declared uh, uh, with uh, an outbreak of Ebola. What would you actually put, uh, what types of instruments and capabilities and capacities and ways to protect would you empower this individual with? And often enough, um, when thinking about this question, you know, these sets of analogies, there have been a lot of uh, comparisons between technologies that have come about, you know, we're literally uh, looking at our sewage to be able to tell, uh, to be able to tell variants of uh, uh, COVID, uh, we have mRNA vaccines, just incredible speed at which vaccines were delivered. A majority of healthcare visits are happening through online uh, capacity and capabilities that we could have never thought about. So it almost seems like we are in a new era of medicine. And at that same time, I'm just always reminded of this quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I cannot tell you, and I'm sure, I mean, I was talking to Sachin the, in a couple of hours ago, and just how brokenhearted many of us are in science where we have seen the harsh reality of this inequality of access. I mean, when you think about two to 3% of the world population is vaccinated by many nations, including you know, the places that I'm sitting in are getting booster shots and just the capacity of diagnostics not being uh, comparatively equally distributed around the world. We have all known this you know, you can think about COVID has a lot of attention. Every single issue with COVID, you could relate with malaria itself. But unless we think about this inequality, any of the progress that we make, any of the advanced tools, any of the new vaccines that would come about, none of that would matter. 
none of that would matter because many of these diseases would still prevail. And often enough, you can ask yourself a question, will we ever eliminate uh, pathogens like COVID? And I'm doubtful with the strategies that we have taken so far, whether there is any hope in being able to eliminate and really actually bring the capacity to fight these diseases in all corners of the world. And this is why it lies on many of our shoulders to be really thinking hard about access and equality and cost. Every single solution that you're thinking about, you have to be scratching your head, could you bring it to masses? And again, all of this is based on fundamental science and it takes a lot of time, effort, energy, and technological advances to be able to bring simple solutions. But in the end, we have to be thinking about simple solutions. So uh, one of the things that I wanna do now is, uh, this was my pitch for frugal science. Uh, I hope uh, some of you think about uh, these sets of challenges. I think working in India alone itself makes you a frugal scientist when it takes so much time and effort to even get simple reagents sometimes. But uh, it's actually important to remember how to translate some of our discoveries into the context of simple solutions. I'm gonna share a few examples of what I have enjoyed in the last you know, almost 10 years I've been here thinking about this problem. Much of what I'm about to tell you is shaped by my conversations with uh, friends, collaborators, all across Africa, India, and in the US. And much of these trips and spending time in the field is really what has seeded many of the ideas that I'm about to tell you. I'm going to now take a rapid pace in sharing a set of ideas. And I'm hopeful, you know, if you have questions, uh, and I'll get a deal. And one of the challenges I remember very explicitly as a young faculty uh, traveling in Uganda, I met a, a veteran of microscopy in Uganda. He had trained malaria microscopists for the last 40 years. And he mentioned to me, you know, Manu, you should come back to me when you can deliver solutions that work under a tree. And, you know, for a second, I scratch my head, you know, what do you mean work under a tree? We were in a hospital in Kampala, we had every possibility. And what he really meant was to really be able to bring these to primary health centers. So many of the solutions that I'll talk about are really on the extreme edge of thinking about lack of resources. To be able to bring these capacities, say, of molecular diagnostics and the highest precision microscopy in the middle of nowhere. So I take that challenge quite seriously. And for many of the solutions we've been thinking about, uh, you know, that moment has inspired me significantly. So I'll briefly talk about malaria. I'll talk about mosquito surveillance, uh, diagnostics in general, and I'll maybe bumble around some of the environmental monitoring tools as well. Uh, but much of this work is published, so you can go back and look through some of these threads. And I think what I'm really hoping, this would be the beginning and a start for us as tool makers, uh, what our role is to bring these sets of tools into hands of researchers like you. So if any of you find any utility in what I'm talking about, please do reach out to me. We are very eager to scale many of these solutions and share them very broadly uh, in a very open access format. Uh, all of the tools that I'm describing uh, are open access uh, and uh, we're trying to make them widely available. Uh, I'll probably, I don't know if I'll get a chance to talk about COVID and my engagement in COVID. Maybe in the very end of the talk, I'll probably come back to this. So let's skip this for right now. Uh, so let me tell you a few short stories. This is a picture from Uganda from that same trip. And I explicitly remember working for a month in a primary healthcare center and realizing that regularly my colleagues were using a very fancy centrifuge as a doorstop. And, you know, it irked me quite a lot because these centrifuges were expensive. And of course, I noticed at that time that there was no electricity. Um, and we started thinking about, you know, many of you use centrifugation in analytical sciences and to be able to really centrifuge, are you only dependent on electricity? And while coming back on a flight, uh, I started thinking about toys. <laughs> Many of you have played with yo-yos. Uh, this, if I was in person, I would ask you for a quiz. 
but uh, I will just let you guess in your head how fast does a yo-yo spin? Uh, if some of you have not thrown a yo-yo, uh, you can think about several other toys. And uh, we started doing back of the envelope calculations for every possible spinning toy. Uh, and then, of course, what we ran in into it very quickly is this really simple toy. It's called a button on a string. I'm absolutely sure many of you as kids have played with this toy. You take a button, you take two strings, you weave through a thread, and you spin, and it seems to seemingly spin very fast. But at that time, nobody had actually asked a question of how fast or fundamentally how fast could this toy spin. And we made a realization that this toy happens to be the oldest toy in the history of mankind. So even in Harappan culture, people have found these little clay buttons with two holes that have been used with threads to, in the Greek culture, it was a musical instrument. In the Inuit culture, it's actually used. And uh, seemingly nobody had asked a question of how does this very simple toy work? And I think for us, that's really the joy. This is the science of frugal science that you can find a very simple object that's right in front of your eyes. And if you ask the right question, you uncover completely new science. So we spent six math, uh, six months uh, doing some math to really be able to derive how does this toy actually work. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but one thing you can think about is uncovering the science behind the oldest toy in, uh, you know, that humans have ever played with uh, is an absolute joy by itself. But it's even more joyful when we realize that we can convert this simple toy into a really powerful centrifuge. So at this point, we hold the world record for human powered centrifugation, where we can spin this object with just no effort to roughly around 125,000 RPM. That's equivalent of 30,000 G forces. So if you have these very large scale centrifuges that are used in the lab, we can match that for a price point of 20 cents. You can take plasma and in 90 seconds, you can separate and get pure plasma. If many of you work on uh, antibody tests or uh, these lateral flow assay tests, you know that many a times uh, the enzymes in blood cells can really inhibit reactions and having pure plasma is very valuable. If any of you think about anemia, uh, the ratio of this uh, red pack blood cell to the plasma volume gives you an indication of anemia as a beginning. And literally, I mean, one of the factors there is the simplicity of this allows us to immediately start thinking about a very broad range of application. We've used this tool to pull out uh, individual malaria parasites. As many of you know that the density of a single cell infected by a parasite changes, so we can do something very much like a Buffy coat that's done in a QBC, a quantitative Buffy coat, and pull out a parasite uh, using a very simple tool like this. But Really, the joy of this is going back to the education piece again. Uh, we have a field site in Madagascar where we work on a large scale clinical validation of this tool. Here is a village chief in the mountains. It takes me roughly around a day to actually get to the village. Uh, and until the village chief approves, no matter what the Malagasy government says or the health ministry says, I can't actually work in this community. And what I mean by simple tools is people having the capacity to understand and not just building black boxes, but enabling them to build upon your work. When we released this tool, uh, literally we started seeing many other tools that people started building on the same principle. And when COVID hit, we actually released a diagnostic test, uh, kind of a 30 minute home diagnostic test built on a very simple uh, now, even a simpler version of a platform we call HandyFuge. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but much of this is published. And on the internet, I started seeing designs across the world. People starting to build bacterial assays, uh, urine uh, assays. Uh, there's uh, certain recent sets of uh, papers looking at building cell phone chargers using these tools. And very recently, essentially exploring the role of fidget spinners. Um, and it's been a joy to watch because, you know, in the end, uh, these sets of uh, 
sharing the sets of tools and technologies and the capacity opens others to build the sets of platforms. And if they have the capacity, the sets of samples, and they can really build upon your work, that is really, as a scientist, the most joyful part of doing science. And it's it's been a very interesting example all the way from high school students to uh, researchers and companies across the world, uh, essentially utilizing these simple principles to now build upon what we had shared. Uh, I'm going to switch to the next example. Uh, now we will go from diagnostics to surveillance. And I don't know at the Institute how much work is done on mosquito surveillance, but this is a problem that we've been thinking about for a while. And uh, I mean, this is supposed to be a joke, but it's not really a joke. Uh, I call it the mosquito bucket challenge. And I don't know how many of you have spent time sorting through mosquitoes on a microscope. <laughs> Uh, this is a postdoc in Australia. This is a real picture of a bucket, uh, maybe 10 to 20,000 mosquitoes. And you can see a little tweezer in his hand, and he's going to sort out mosquitoes to identify species. It's very important to understand the distribution of mosquitoes. And one of the key challenges that I realized when I first saw this uh, practice in Thailand, I found it shocking because exactly this is what Ronald Ross did in India when he first identified malaria and mosquitoes. Individually catching mosquitoes, dissecting them to try to understand what the distribution of mosquitoes looked like. And at that time, uh, I started thinking about cell phones and that led to a tool that we have recently released, uh, which is an acoustic based detection of self uh, mosquito species. And I'm gonna see if I can play, uh, this is called a buzz. And uh, I think I don't have the audio recording, unfortunately, here, which is really fun. But I guess, yeah, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard mosquitoes buzzing in your ears. You don't need to know. Uh, anybody who grew up in India knows what it feels like. Uh, the realization that we made is because of the biology of how mosquitoes mate in flight, uh, they essentially band shift uh, and just literally using a $5 flip phone, we can record a buzzing mosquito that's flying around in your proximity, you know, 10, 15 centimeters. And from that, we're able to build maps using machine learning to identify what mosquito it might be. The purpose of this tool, again, going back to citizen science, is we possibly have 5 billion cell phones on this planet. So we possibly have 5 billion folks who could potentially actually track mosquitoes in mosquito populations. Now that leads to a app that we are releasing. Uh, I think a beta version of this is out. And uh, this led to an incredible communities of entomologists. Uh, we essentially openly shared this uh, and we started receiving data from around the world uh, with, uh, you know, not just uh, academic scientists, but uh, school kids. So this is a video from Madagascar I received. Uh, this is a primary school where these kids are learning about acoustic frequencies of mosquitoes and after that going in their villages to actually map mosquitoes uh, that are potentially causing malaria. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is again, Going back to the sharing the joy of science, you know, without, we can write as many academic papers, we can, uh, you know, rise through the ranks, unless we can make our tools widely available to communities around the world that can actually directly benefit from them and making the tools viable such that they actually have a chance to be able to engage. Uh, you know, it, it really is hard to be able to make the kind of impact that we all care about. Uh, so this site will be up soon. If any of you do mosquito surveillance, I would love to be able to train you how to use this tool. It's very simple. All the APIs are open. You can build upon it. Very recently, we have actually demonstrated that for filariasis and several other diseases, uh, we can both identify the sets of species, uh, but potentially there might be enough signal to be able to even detect whether the mosquito itself is sick which is something that we've been working on for a while. And then I'm gonna to transition uh, to using another tool in the same context to actually track viruses. 
So, so far, I just mentioned about being able to identify a species of mosquitoes, but as you know, there are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of pathogens. Many of them we might never have even seen, and they have zoonotic transmission. They have vector-borne uh, hosts, and one of the challenges that is, is how do you know what is where and in what abundance? And we can take an example of dengue. You know, why is it that dengue occurs at this periodic frequency? Can you predict before you get an outbreak of dengue whether the mosquito populations locally might actually have a, a large abundance of dengue circulating? And even for malaria, you know, how many exact number of pathogens are actually injected in a single bite when a mosquito bites a human? Incredible number of open questions. And we started realizing that the tools that we have for molecular surveillance of mosquitoes were missing. And that led to this project uh, called Vector Chip. Uh, these are uh, two of my postdocs, Shelob and Felix, that were involved. Uh, Abuzz, uh, the acoustic project that I talked about, uh, was done with my graduate student, Hari Priya Mukundrajan. Uh, and one of the contexts that we started thinking about is could we use mosquito as a pipetter? Could we actually get to collecting and doing, I mean, many of you know the advances in single cell seek and the kinds of genomic information that we can extract from single cells. We asked, what could we do from a single bite? And mosquitoes are amazing pipetter, uh, if any of you have been bitten. Uh, so this is a tool that we built, we call it vector chip. And I'll just first explain what you're seeing in this video. I've labeled the mosquitoes with a fluorescent dye, and I'm gonna play this again, but if you watch right here, if you can see my cursor, right there where the mosquito bites, they leave a tiny fluorescent dot. And now all across this, you're seeing single saliva bites that have been left by these mosquitoes. Now we can run molecular analysis on every one of these bites to literally count the total number of active viruses that might be there, and to our surprise, without ever catching a mosquito, we can find mosquito DNA in these bites and hence tell which species of mosquitoes it came from. So this has been really fun. Uh, we call this vector chip, and I think uh, the paper is posted online. Uh, so I'm gonna very briefly show results from this and get back to this machine learning tool that we also developed for tracking mosquitoes. So first of all, this is what a vector chip looks like. You can think of this as an array of tiny, tiny, tiny wells. Some of these wells are as small as around 100 micron, so the side of a proboscis. And we post this chip essentially outdoors with some odorants, and we can image it when we want to, but we don't have to actually directly image it. We can measure, for example, directly the salivary volume that's being injected. And that's roughly around 0.6 nanoliters uh, is the average saliva that uh, many of these mosquitoes are leaving when they're generating these bites. But one of the discoveries that we made in this is we had to reinvent a method or a kind of a chip, a microfluidic chip that allows us to interact with mosquitoes. And we can mechanically build a gating function. So you should think of these as very, very thin membranes and we can choose the thickness of the membrane to choose which species of mosquitoes we want to bite. Because mechanically, there is a large variation associated with what these mosquitoes can actually bite. So this is what these chips look like, uh, but I'll just jump to the actual assays. Uh, this is all just controls, but uh, let me just get to this assay. So what we've been able to do is take infected mosquitoes say this is uh, Aedes aegypti infected with Zika, have them bite these wells and actually know both what species of mosquito is biting the well and how many quantitatively number of viral copies were injected by that single bite. Uh, we can do this both for the virus itself and essentially for the mosquito species. And uh, with a couple of tricks uh, using essentially a, a, a focal point assay with a cell culture inside, we can actually also count the total number of live viruses that were injected in this single bite. 
So I'm very excited about this because I'm looking for collaborators to now take this tool to the field to really understand the fundamental dynamics of what is the abundance of uh, dengue positive mosquitoes, for example, or malaria positive mosquitoes in regions where there is endemic transmission, in regions where there is seasonal transmission, to really be able to map quantitatively how does the disease dynamics in mosquitoes map to the disease dynamics in humans. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, fun experiments associated with uh, being able to think quite a lot about how when these parasites are injected into the body, uh, they decide to find capillaries and just the very basic biophysics of uh, malaria parasites itself. So I'm going to transition to some microscopy tools. Um, continuing on the thread of mosquitoes, we also built another uh, uh, AI-driven tool, which we call Vitoscope. This was driven by our desire that when we would work with mosquitoes, literally we had thousands of mosquitoes and we couldn't say anything quantitative about it. So this is, all of this work is open source. Uh, you can download, uh, it's called Vitoscope. But what it allows us to do is something quite fun where I'm gonna play this video on the left. You can see we have hundreds of mosquitoes that are biting these substrates, but uh, we can count and track every single mosquito, we can measure their engorgement, we can measure how many times they bite, and we can connect any of the sets of insecticides or pesticides or any chemical cues that might change their behavior very quantitatively without doing any manual work. So, uh, you know, what this allows us to do is for a single mosquito, we can break down their behavior, say, of 20 minutes of engagement with this imaging chip to really understand everything that they did during that time. And being able to compare that in a context of when you have, say, an insecticide or you have a, a mosquito repellent, uh, we can literally count their legs, count the number of times they probe. And kind of a one fun way of thinking about this is the video on the left and the right uh, to really be able to quantitatively say when you prepare and build many of these new chemistries against mosquitoes, could we really bring quantitative numbers uh, on how is the behavior modulated as a function of age, as a function of species? Um, and all of this is very, very simple uh, from an imaging context, and the rest of it is just open source tools that are available at this point. So this tool is called Bitoscope. Um, uh, but one of the fun things that we can do with this is we can actually understand the biophysics of biting behavior in mosquitoes. So this is unpublished work, but we are working on understanding feeding behavior, really what happens uh, at the point when mosquitoes probe and search. There's a recent paper that uh, we have supported uh, from Leslie Wassell's lab where they've been able to show uh, neuronal sensing that's associated in the stylus of the mosquito that senses the chemical cues that are associated with when mosquitoes bite. So this has become a very versatile tool to really be able to do mosquito biology in a very quantitative manner. Okay, so I'm gonna switch uh, very briefly to malaria diagnostics, and then uh, I wanna talk a lot more about science education. So I don't have to tell you why malaria is important. Uh, many of my experiences in malaria are also shaped by spending time in the field. Uh, I was able to spend a few weeks uh, in uh, Kalahandi uh, with an NGO, really just trying to, I've spent a lot of time mostly in Africa, Uganda, and Kenya, really trying to understand on the ground the sets of challenges. And I often come back to microscopy and think about uh, GIMSA stains, for example. And many of you use uh, possibly or have used in the past GIMSA stains. I mean, that stain is almost 100 years old. Uh, the original paper that won GIMSA described it was 1904. And one of the things that I think about, this is, you know, a one room a diagnostic center with incredible technicians who are working very hard, eight hours a day, but it still takes too much time and effort to really do a field microscopy. And we've been thinking about this challenge uh, and we released a tool uh, last year, which is called Octopi, 
this is a big brother of Foldscope. It costs roughly around $100 to build. It's completely open source, but it automates the challenge. It's You should think of it as a hybrid between a flow cytometer and microscopy. And one of the things that we are able to do is it's completely modular. So depending on the sets of capabilities that you require, we can modify the tool dramatically. But one thing that I'll describe is now, let's just briefly take a look at this tool. Uh, what you're looking at is a live demo, that's a blood smear. And uh, you put your imaging head and you walk away. The entire tool is powered with a cell phone battery. A single battery lasts for eight to 10 hours. And at this point, the tool automatically does autofocusing. Uh, it does both fluorescence and bright field imaging. So it's starting to scan. And at this point, it's starting to scan and collect data. So it's completely hands-free. But one of the key characteristics of the tool is within five minutes, a simple tool like this, it's not much larger than a box like this. I can collect around 15 million uh, objects. So 15 million cells. And again, even a, a human microscopist just sitting, spending half an hour could image 5,000 to 10,000 cells. And that gives you a glimpse of the biology of what's happening with the patient, really quantitatively trying to understand uh, what is going on both with the disease and really understanding the capacity of pushing the bounds of diagnostics in the context of malaria. And the reason this is possible, of course, is uh, much of the work in uh, machine learning. Uh, but very importantly, it's also been very interesting of what has happened with uh, these uh, autonomous cars. So many of you know self-driving cars have been talked about for a while. But that enabled these graphical processors uh, to be extremely cheap that are used because these cars are very data driven. So they have to process massive amount of data on board. So there is no cloud. Every single decision is made on board on the tool itself. And that really allows us to really be able to do this uh, in real time. Uh, and then the second aha moment for us was we realized that rather than doing microscopy, we can do spectroscopy. So the trick that we actually use is we discovered a class of dyes for parasites that not only label the parasite, but there is a spectral shift in the color associated with the cells. So I'm just going to show you very rapidly some patient data that will make this clear. But in this picture, you can see this. The blue dot is a platelet and the green dot is the parasite. And I'm using a very low resolution objective. And from that dot, you could not tell what this, if this is a pathogen or a human cell, but using the spectral shift, and this is associated with the ratio of DNA to RNA between different cells. And we quantified the sets of dyes that demonstrate a spectral shift that is associated when you have a different amount of RNA to DNA. And that allows us to do something really wonderful. So what you're looking at on the left, for example, are all of the uh, platelets and they are deep blue. While on the right, you're literally looking at, uh, this is a high speed video that I've converted all the 15 million cells that it collected. I'm running through them very rapidly. So all you see is the cell in a focus, but the data that's streaming through and you know anybody could tell between blue versus green if you're looking at your screens, and so our classification task becomes incredibly easy compared to be able to actually do this on a morphological basis. And at this point, we are screening for a large number of chemical compounds to really be able to bring this very broad technique of not just doing microscopy, but doing spectroscopy at a single cell resolution to enable field science. And one of the things that I'm excited about, and I think this is also why I was very excited about hearing from Sachin, is I am excited just like full scope to release a network of these tools. So the goal currently is to build around a hundred of these and give them to collaborators, many of you, you know, listening to be able to use these tools for a very broad number of applications. Of course, we have developed this for malaria. We've been working on TB for a while, 
But the network that we are trying to create is we kind of call it the Octopi network, which is associated with enabling at an early stage, give this as a research tool to anybody who would like to, and build a cohort of a community of people. Remember, very much like what was done for Sputnik. Empowering people with powerful microscopy tools that are still low cost that you could deploy in your field science, but also be able to understand the context of the diseases. So there's roughly around 25 institutes that I have spoken to because I have primarily worked in Africa. Majority of these uh, institutes are in Africa. And the reason I was quite excited about Sachin's uh, email was I would love to color the map of India with these sets of tools itself and find collaborators to really use these tools for all kinds of applications. I think, you know, what this is one of the importance for us when we build and design tools, we build them general purpose enough that people can really take them in many different directions. But if many of you are involved in malaria diagnostics, I would love to collaborate to really be able to build a very large scale validation platform. And because of machine learning depends so much on data that's collected in the field, it's incredibly important for us to really have the ownership of that validation really lie on the shoulders of many people like yourself. So if you're interested in something like that, that I would just be delighted to actually engage. Uh, there is another ecological tool that we have built. This is really designed for microplastics and trying to understand the population in the ocean. Uh, this is called planktoscope. I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. Uh, but if you go to this website, planktoscope.org, you can find this tool. And very much like now, instead of uh, patient samples or infectious samples, this is really designed for ecological samples. And again, uh, unlike Octopi, where the microscope moves, here the samples flow through. So if any of you work on schistosomiasis, we're building a diagnostic tool associated with uh, the, the tool itself. Uh, but again, much of this information is online. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, Sachin, how much time do I have? I'm going to take a pause. And uh, I'm just wondering how much, how much more time do I have? Please go ahead. Go ahead. We have ample time. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to tell a few more stories, but maybe now you will hear that the talk will become exponentially faster because I'm excited about uh, actually fielding some questions and talking to you all and hearing some feedback. Uh, but let me just say two more short stories and then we will open up for questions. Uh, the next tool is a, a molecular diagnostic tool, which we call SnapDX. Uh, this tool has been in the works for the last, you know, six years. We've been thinking about this, but really COVID forced me to really think hard about this challenge. And again, I think COVID diagnostics has really, from a technological perspective, led to an incredible set of advances in molecular diagnostics. But what has bothered me is molecular diagnostics is still way too expensive and it is still not accessible to primary health centers. And that's the same thread that we could say about molecular diagnostics for malaria. And one of the things that we started thinking about is could we really deliver uh, electricity free molecular test? And the answer for that is yes. Uh, I call this tool SnapDX. It's inspired from a glow stick. I don't know how many of you have played with a glow stick in the past that you crack and it lights up. It kind of looks like a hybrid between a glow stick and a syringe. And much of the details for this tool is on this website uh, that I run called snapdx.org. Uh, but the idea is very simple. How do you really bring molecular assays to, and again, you know, all of us saw the surge in India. Uh, we were involved in supporting uh, diagnostic teams and really the sets of challenges that they faced and still face in being able to do uh, diagnostics in rural communities. Uh, the sample that we chose for this was saliva. Uh, you know, lots of debates can be had between nasopharyngeal. I am a strong believer that saliva has just a remarkable capabilities in thinking about for many different diagnostic tests. And one of the aspects of that is associated with how early 
and how much the load is in saliva. And again, with the Delta variant, just the loads are astronomical in some sense, but a lot has been published on that. Uh, the way the tool works is actually very simple. Uh, it's uh, kind of a Russian doll. So it is self-contained. Uh, you open that blue cap and you spit in it and you close and you dump it in hot water. And every other step after that actually happens through uh, this process. And you can just go online on snapdx.org's website to see the actual tool, but you know, it, it goes through the entire process. I'm not gonna show you, but literally we pour boiling water in it. Uh, roughly it takes around 35 uh, minutes to actually run. Uh, and all the reagents and the nucleic acid extraction, uh, everything happens and closed with no pipetting, which is key. And then the other aspect of this is we have built a collaboration that allows us to use completely open source enzymes to be able to do this. And currently from a sensitivity perspective, we can do something like uh, 50 copies per microliter from a detection perspective. Uh, this is a lamp based assay. And I think again, the physics or the mechanics of the tool is compatible to many other chemistries themselves. But I think I actually prefer LAMP uh, in general. The reason I brought this up is at this point, we are in the stage of starting to look for large scale manufacturing partners. And the way we manufacture these is very similar to how ballpoint pens are made. And one of the key insights we had, again, going back to Frugal Science too, for literally around 40 cents, we can make all the hardware associated with this. And for around 20 cents, we can put together all the sets of enzymes. So again, you know, bill of materials is not the same as a cost to patients, but my goal is to really be able to bring either a, a dollar or a $2 test. Uh, we have collected a large number of collaborative partners, uh, including ICGEB, uh, some of the folks at DBT. So it's actually, I am again, looking for validation partners uh, and especially because we are moving from lab-based setting now to a field setting. So if any of you have interest in validating saliva-based diagnostics, I would love to hear from you. And I think much of the validation work that we do, we do it in a very close partnership. So, you know, rather than just us getting access to samples, I'm looking for partners where we can ship. Uh, you know, we made around 10,000 of these units for the validation trials and we have partners in Guatemala, Peru, Bolivia, but now I'm looking for some partners in India. So that's another reason I wanted to bring this up. This is ongoing work. There is still work to be done, but it's extremely valuable and important to think about the future of molecular diagnostics. So with that, I'm going to switch to kind of the last part of this talk, which was really about education. Uh, and I think this has to do with curiosity. And you might wonder that, you know, we all work on some very serious diseases, including malaria and TB and, I mean, COVID, it just, you know, the, the collapse of the healthcare system has shown us how under pressure that we all can be. And again, I kudos to all of you. I have followed through just an incredible amount of what the scientific community in India was able to deliver. I am just in shock and awe for how much you all took on your shoulders. And then you might ask, what does curiosity have to do in these times? You know, and one of the things I remind myself every time is unless we are having fun, no matter what or how hard the circumstances is, we lose our, we lose our passion and we, you know, we can't be creative, which is necessary if you're going to create new tools. And I think in the context of education, I started thinking about curiosity almost 10 years ago when we released this tool, which is called Foldscope, uh, which is literally a $1 paper microscope anybody in the world can have. And we started asking ourselves, I mean, much of the data on what you can do with the Foldscope is published, so I'm not going to talk about this, but I want to talk about the community aspect. When we built this tool, you know, I started as a young faculty at Stanford and I knew why I was doing this. I knew it was important to give scientific tools to people, but even people around me didn't really understand why we wanted to do this. 
you know, is this a toy? And should we as scientists even spend any time building toys? And, you know, to me, uh, microscopy is so fundamental to our understanding of the world. I wanted every single kid to have a microscope in their pocket. And it took almost, uh, you know, I'm sort of sad to say this, it took almost five years for me to convince many people around the world that this actually is an important challenge that we should take. At this point, you know, when we built this tool, we shipped around 100,000 of them to people around the world, anybody who asked for it. They didn't have to be a scientist. They didn't have to be of any age group. If you asked for it, we shipped it to them. And it's been almost uh, around uh, 10 years now, and we have shipped roughly around 1.5 million full scopes at this point. This is the world's largest microscopy community in the world. And I'm really proud of this is because of the adoption that came from India. You can see India is covered as densely as Europe and US. And that happened because of two people in the Indian science community, uh, Shelja and Vijay, who are both uh, in the PSA's office. Vijay runs the PSA's office. And it was a, a accidental connection on Twitter uh, where Vijay said, would you be interested in engaging with community partners in India? And I didn't know Vijay at that time. I just said, that's exactly what we wanted to do. And that led to a massive program. You know, the Indian science community using this tool has discovered completely new uh, species, uh, completely new applications for this tool in agriculture, veterinary science, and really bringing it to the grassroots. I mean, I grew up in India and I grew up in uh, a place where, you know, I don't know, I didn't have any access to science and I didn't know what science was. I was a curious kid and I know that is so common. And I think in the programs, I go back and reflect at my own childhood and I see the value of being just able to explore our world. Uh, unless we can do that, I don't think we will have a capacity in our society to think scientifically, to really be able to adopt and again, come up with the kinds of creative solutions that we need. You know, we don't need a handful of scientists in India. We need millions and millions of people engaging in the process of science. And that has been an incredible joy to me. People who have never picked up a pencil and written at this point are now proficient microscopist and can actually sometimes even tell you the types of pathogens or the types of microscopic organisms that are living in their neighborhood. And that brings me a lot of joy. You know, this is a picture again from Chhattisgarh with a community, a tribal community trying to understand to uh, be able to detect pathogens in plants. Uh, you know, literally 500 or so papers have been published on this tool where people have been able to really document their discoveries in scientific literature for the very first time. And I think just, I had not anticipated both the kind of growth of the community, but also the power of being able to share the tools with other people. So if you have anything you take away from this message, remember, we are all part of a global community. And if you can take your science and share it with other people, it will multiply many fold. You have to pass the ownership of what you do to communities around the world, and then you just get to watch. And it really is a very joyful moment to be able to see how uh, completely new ideas come about because of the types of tools you all enable. So I'm gonna stop here. I think I was gonna mention a few words about uh, kind of my engagement in India COVID SOS, but I'll leave that if somebody has a question, I, with a few of my colleagues started an organization essentially for our, because of desperation of what happened in the second wave from far away to support uh, nonprofit organizations, government agencies in India on anything that they needed uh, in the second wave and that has led to a very large, broad community just working together on a volunteer basis uh, to help and support uh, 
uh, when these types of surges happen, we are start, still thinking about what is the future of this organization, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And just as an advertisement, uh, during the pandemic, I finally launched my frugal science class. So for many of the young students who want to really dive in and actually explore these ideas, you can go to this site. All the lectures are freely available. Uh, we had around 35 countries, 150 students last year that joined and roughly around 30 projects that we launched. But I will be teaching that again, I think January uh, this year, uh, if anybody is interested. This is an open class. There are no fees. Anybody can join. You can drop any time. Uh, it's just a, it's if you're excited and passionate. And then let me leave you all with this slide. Uh, just, uh, you know, I think certain times when we do science, uh, it brings a lot of joy to us. This picture brings a lot of joy to me because this picture was taken in a village in Tamil Nadu. And when I see this picture, I can hear the kids. I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear them. I hear the kind of excitement that they have for science for the first time to really be able to see through the microscopic world. Uh, but this picture also makes me sad. It makes me sad because, you know, it took us 10 years to get to a million microscopes and there are 2 billion kids on this planet. So unless all of us as scientists take the time and effort to bring science to the broadest group of people, you know, not just the schools that our kids go to or not just the communities or the people where your institutes are, but to truly all across the country and all across the globe for that matter. We will not be able to build a future that is driven by scientific insights. And this is really not a side project. You know, this is not an outreach that looks good. It is a fundamental necessity for science to survive. Uh, and again, we knew this before COVID for what's happening with climate change, but really COVID should be a wake up call for all of us as scientists to be thinking about how do we truly broadly engage with society and what is the role of society in our science? So on that note, I will end. I apologize again. Uh, I took longer than I had thought, but uh, we can open up for questions. I definitely have around half an hour to just stick around. Uh, so. And again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Manu. Thank you very much for your, you know, very exciting talk. And definitely we are, you know, similarly excited to collaborate with you. And as you promised, once you are here, we'll be happy to host you here in person. Yeah, no, I would, I would be delighted to spend some time. Yeah. So it's it's a question time, but you know, I don't see any question. I can read a lot of appreciation messages here. So I request- We can, we can everyone, wait, anybody, anybody, they can yes. just either talk their question or just write, uh, you know, you can also comment. This is just, I have half an hour I saved for just a conversation. Right. So, so there's there a, question. a question from yes. Manju, right? Yes. yes. Manju, do you wanna do you wanna just speak and say your question? Hi, good morning. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Manu Prakash, for a lovely talk. I was just curious, and I have seen your work in some other meeting as well. Uh, the folder scope and the next version which you showed is very exciting. And I'm from a public health background, so I was just curious. And you have worked in Kala Handi. Uh, and as you said, uh, the diagnostic under a tree, which practically means a point of care test at the lowest at the grassroots level of healthcare, which mm -hmm. is usually at the moment is RDT, but this, the photoscope you presented is kind of a replacement for microscope. So mm -hmm. how the, the training levels or the infrastructure required for this, it's a, it's a cell, cell phone of kind of a battery running for mm -hmm. eight hours. So power supply should not be a problem. But in general, what is the level of healthcare you are looking at that this folder scope can be applicable, the level of training, infrastructure required, and the mental shift the yeah. uh, care uh, community will require to move from something very primitive microscopy to something very advanced like your folder scope. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think I mean a fantastic question, and the the new tool we we call it Octopi, and you know there are different jokes about why we name uh, these sets of tools. Uh, but one of the ways I, you're absolutely right about a frame shift in thinking, and I think one of the reasons that we are starting this Octopi network is for many people to be able to ask because you can Im imagine in different context. And in different communities, the types of training programs might be very different. You know, in the end, uh, we as tool makers, it's almost a conversation. So, you know, my time spent in Kalahandi really shaped my thinking of the simplification of this tool. So we have automated a lot of it. But in the end, what we are, I'm really looking for is, you know, people like you who have spent time in public health to both be able to give feedback, but also to just, you know, I think I am making a hundred of these tools uh, and I want to deploy them in communities to really get large scale feedback. Uh, and one of the perspectives is building trust between the doctors, between the technician and the technology. So, for example, a feature that we built in this new tool is of course it automates and it counts all the sets of parasites, but it actually gives you the direct images that you could look through to get an intuition for what these sets of parasites should look like if there is something going on. Again, thinking about the robustness of the stains, the simplification associated with that. Um, and much of that is work in progress. Uh, but I think what we have learned from our first version of Foldscope with a very broad range of applications built on top. Uh, I have realized that as tool makers, we have the ownership to share our tools broadly. And then there is another layer of development that happens even on top of this that really makes it context specific. So I'm quite excited. I mean, we were supposed to start a large scale validation trial last year in Uganda for around a thousand patients and all of that got shut down. So I'm really eager for COVID travel restrictions to be lifted. Um, and I think, yeah, it would be valuable, especially with this institute to explore where should we think about both validation, but usability uh, with community health workers as a target point. Okay, so uh, another question I can see here. Wingbeat optics could be very good for identifying mosquitoes in the field scenario. How do you overcome the other disturbances in the field? <laughs> How precise was your identification in the field situation? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a very important question. And uh, it's been a really fun thing for us to really be improving the tool over time. So we do some amount of noise cancellation uh, one of the key insights is that we essentially only use, uh, you know, less than a second or a two second of a clip, which is the acoustic sound. And so in a sound that is interspersed with noise, we can still uh, cut out uh, algorithmically and get uh, kind of a signature. Uh, one of the aspects of this is also, you know, just a little bit of a training associated with how to collect the data. And there are these uh, videos that we have shared online. I do many trainings. Uh, so it takes just a little bit of sets of uh, very simple rules in terms of thinking about the kind of data to collect as well. And right now we are making our APIs available online such that uh, people can also just use our data sets uh, and uh, develop many other machine learning algorithms as well. Because that field is moving so fast, it's extremely important to collect field-driven data that has the kind of noise. So we can simulate that. The largest trial that we have run is in two places. One is in rural Alabama, and the second one is with the health ministry in Ethiopia. And, uh, you know, because there is, uh, uh, yeah, there are many surveillance challenges, and I think, of course, uh, with some of the the political challenges there, it's become really urgent for surveillance to still continue in difficult circumstances. 
Uh, and I think, yeah, it would be fantastic if some of you do spend time in the field. I'm very happy if you have some uh, folks who spend time in the field to do a quick training session, and then you can use our platform to, you know, organize the data, uh, ask many different questions associated with this itself. Another uh, question I can see here, can we have biophysical methods for insecticide resistance and susceptible mosquitoes species? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the tool is called Bitoscope. Uh, it's very easy to build. Uh, so uh, any of you can actually play with this. One of the things that I'm excited about is seeing whether we could do for insecticide resistance um, very quantitative assays, just in terms of thinking about very quantitative behavior measurements that could actually directly be used. So, yeah, I think if some of you run these types of assays, uh, you could just send me a message. The tool is very simple to replicate. All the code is, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the tool is called Bitoscope. Uh, it's very easy to build, uh, so uh, any of you can actually play with this. One of the things that I'm excited about is seeing whether we could do for insecticide resistance um, very quantitative assays, just in terms of thinking about very quantitative behavior measurements that could actually directly be used. So, yeah, I think. If some of you run these types of assays, uh, you could just send me a message. The tool is very simple to replicate. All the code is online and accessible. And the idea would be is uh, uh, depending on, we've done this for DDT a little bit to really just try to understand uh, identification where we would coat a certain portion of the chip with DDT leave the other portion um, unmasked uh, and just compare behavior. So it's it's very, very simple to run. And I think one of the goals is that if any of you are interested, uh, it's fairly easy to get started. Okay. Uh, one of the question is how much the noise data due to staining may affect the automated diagnosis through spectroscopy? Yeah, no, I think that's a very important question. And one of the things that we have done because of that is a screen for several different dyes. And uh, there is another tool that I didn't talk about uh, where we also have a very simple tool to standardize staining process itself. Many a times, uh, you know, when smears are made in the field, they have very large variation in quality. So this led to both standardization on the amount of dye, the smear itself, all done in a single shot that allows us to sort of make the reliability associated with this. But because we're doing spectroscopy, we are not looking for morphological changes. So one of the things about spectroscopy is it's incredibly robust because it is measuring the amount of RNA to DNA associated with these sets of parasites versus healthy human cells. We essentially find that as long as uh, your stain works and we have a cutoff in the machine because we are collecting such a large amount of data, if we see low quality smear, you can actually mark it. You can mention and connect and share that uh, the, the scan or the smear is not of high enough quality. And so, you know, the way you should think about these types of tools is it's a conversation between the technician and the technology. Our goal is to just really empower the technician. And again, one of the other things we've been thinking about as to how to use these types of automated tools to actually train technicians with the processes. So, you know, if you get feedback on your process itself and the machine itself can go in a training mode where it can tell you the quality of your smear, it actually helps uh, significantly. So we have started some of those usability tests, uh, but I, I think uh, with COVID, a lot of our usability trials have been delayed at this point. 
So I think I'm actually quite excited to get back to the field itself and explore many of these ideas, but it's taken some time. And again, our attention on COVID really did take a hit on malaria work. And I don't know how you all feel about that, of how all of you probably had to uh, switch to COVID. Uh, uh, but then again, you know, uh, all of these problems are equally, and I would say for malaria, it's even more important. So much of the the usability test for the quality of smears is still to come. Yeah. Uh, can the one question can blood be used as a biological material in the home molecular testing tool in spite of saliva? Yeah, no, that's true. When I designed that, uh, I actually was thinking about this. Uh, I was thinking about three things because, you know, malaria diagnostics is one we have worked on for a while in the context of blood. And then the other is TB and handling sputum. So currently the tool is designed in a manner that we can both handle blood, uh, sputum, or just saliva. Uh, and again, it took a long while, but uh, the tool is completely enclosed. And the first thing that we do is we do a heat inactivation protocol that allows us to just inactivate all the live pathogens and parasites as well. So, yeah, I think one of the, it's going to require some amount of tweaks because uh, the current 10,000 units that we made that we are doing the current uh, trial on are all primarily designed for saliva. But very simple changes allow us to enable this for uh, blood assays as well. Can a buzz differentiate infected mosquitoes from different Anopheles species? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm assuming. Uh, so I think this is a question that we've been thinking about for a while. Uh, the jury is still out there. We have used uh, kind of, I think, you know, different model systems to explore this question of either is there a fundamental change in the beat frequencies for infected mosquitoes at different stages? Uh, we've also asked the question of can we tell the age of a mosquito just from its wing beat? We have tantalizing data. I think age is definitely more likely. With the infections, I think as long as a viral species or a disease affects some of the flight muscles, so there are several scenarios in which the flight muscles are actually uh, affected. We have seen certain signatures, but I wouldn't say we have enough convincing data to really think about whether we can do this for anopheles or do this for a malaria, for example, as yet. But again, I think I often go back to thinking about we don't have enough data. So if some of you have an insectary with malaria infected mosquitoes, I would love to collaborate on a lot of different things uh, associated with this. I keep the only mosquito insectary in all of Stanford campus, uh, but it's not enough. I, I can only keep Aedes aegypti, just the, I have a very small lab. So I would, I would love to have many species. So we actually travel around the world collecting much of the data that you saw. Yeah, so I think Dr. Manjurai has again now one more question. Dr. Manjurai? Yes, uh, thanks Sachin and thank you Dr. Manu for uh, again, I mean, this is actually very inspiring. And coming to the portion of vector surveillance where you can also detect pathogen in the mosquito, like I'm especially interested in malaria, where mm -hmm. and because like for, for, for example, India is on elimination mode and now the really the cases and things are going down in India. So, mm -hmm. but the vector density, I assume may not go very down, in, even though there are studies that we can't find mosquitoes in field studies, especially flu atlas. But NFL is Qulisi faces, which is quite abundant in India. And it is yeah. also zoophilic and zoophagic. So I mm -hmm. don't see that even with a very good vector control program, we will be able to keep the vector down. We can kill the parasite, which will lead to the reduction in cases. So the, your method of detecting pathogen in the malaria vector would be the key thing to identify, to really say uh, what we call for other diseases as zero diagnosis. 
So if we yeah. really can identify that pathogen is not there in the mosquito, even if mosquitoes are biting us, but they are benign bites, would be very mm -hmm. good. So how mm -hmm. far technology is is in the identifying the pathogen, and in India, uh, I don't know. It's an open call. Uh, maybe we can talk separately for validation yeah. of your tools in a research mode later on. But mm -hmm. first, can we identify how robust is the pathogen identification in the vectors? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I mean, that is exactly why I'm excited for this conversation because, you know, we can only do so much. And one of the challenges, uh, so first of all, the tool, the paper will be out there literally in a couple of weeks, the first one. We are working on two more uh, papers that are modification of that same tool, but that expands it uh, to really be able to also do this in the field itself. We have done lots of tests in infected cages. And one of the perspectives is the, uh, I think at this point, we can, you know, as long as mosquitoes bite the substrate, as long as you have mosquitoes in a place. And so we don't, you know, we don't develop odorants and things, but those things have been developed for a species that you're targeting, as long as you can attract them, I'm very confident that we can collect bites and do the processing. And one of the things that is very exciting is depending on the type of scientific question we care about, we can actually tell exactly what was that in that bite. So we're working on two key ideas right now. We are working to significantly reduce the cost of the chip itself, which is something that is uh, very doable at this point. And then the second one, we're also just making chips that uh, can be completely dehydrated. So you can leave them out there for, you know, even four or five weeks and collect them at a later time, which allows us to just collect the sets of bites and still preserve the nucleic acids. So both of these are in progress. And I think one of the things that I'm looking for is finding a few people who in a lab setting I mean, we have validated this in Institute Pasteur in Paris. Uh, we have access to innumerable number of pathogens there, but that's in a lab setting. And then we have also validated this for myrovirus uh, in a couple of labs in the US. And now I wanna transition to Anopheles and uh, malaria. So if you have labs that have infected mosquitoes uh, this would be a very straightforward type of a collaboration immediately to validate in hands of other people. And then, of course, the, the key insight is to do as much work in the field itself. I mean, I've collected mosquitoes for dengue, and you can collect tens of thousands of mosquitoes. And, you know, it's a, it's a fairly challenging task to do what we do manually. So I'm actually quite excited about uh, uh, testing this in a field site. And I don't know if, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, there are a couple places in Africa where we have access to these large scale field sites, which are these uh, semi field cages. So I think I could talk to Sachin or if any of you could send me some messages that will also give me a sense of thinking about, oh, this particular facility would actually be fantastic for this particular tool. I think, yeah, the, the, the whole reason I, I wanted to talk to this community was to explore these types of uh, collaborations. Sure. Uh, how you take care of aerosol contamination of lamp amplicon, which may result in false positive in home molecule testing tool? Yeah, so I think we do a couple of tricks. First of all, the unit is completely enclosed. There are no steps after spitting when you close at all times. It's a double caged object. So there is no pipetting. You don't add anything. So there are no aerosols. Uh, there is nothing that can come out of that unit. It's a completely closed unit. And this is what took us so long to figure out is how do you do, you know, the sample that we start with can be as large as two milli, two mLs. But the actual reaction happens in almost only a 10 microliter reaction vessel. So there's a lot of plumbing involved, but without using any electricity or without using any valves or any electronics for that matter. So at this point, uh, that works. 
and I think the other aspect of this is associated with there are a couple of tricks in LAMP uh, where you can use UDG and a couple of uh, enzymes uh, to tweak where uh, the same amplicons might not get amplified in a fresh reaction. But those are very well established. But I think the key, this is a very good question. Uh, the key really is, is a self-contained device that does not uh, have any, uh, any way for the reagents to come out. So even if the user wants to, unless they of course cut it open, like, you know, if the, you took a knife and jabbed at it and opened it, then of course you release the amplicons. Okay. Uh, is there any response or effect on mosquitoes to sound frequencies on their biting behavior? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've thought about it. I, we have never done this experiment. I know some of my colleagues in Australia, Scott Ritchie's lab, a couple other labs have done a few things on playback of sound and seeing a uh, reaction, but we have a very quantitative behavior lasse. So at some point of time, we should do it. I don't, I mean, I think what is clearly, you know, this is a mating behavior, so we should be able to perturb it. Uh, people have talked about using sound as a way to attract more mosquitoes. There is some data. Uh, I think I've always been on the other side of the camp as to using sound to detect. Uh, and again, we are doing a lot of mathematical work right now to really understand how mosquitoes generate such high frequencies because very little is known about the biomechanics of mosquito flight itself. So there's a lot of work that is going in that direction. I, I think we have never done extensive experiments on the other side. Okay, so with your permission, I would like to take this last wonderful questions. This is, this is, I, I would, I would like to read as it is, sir, just a fan request when we can meet in India. <laughs> oh, I, you know, trust me, my, my parents are asking me this all the time. When are you coming? And I think it's, I am. I am eager to plan a trip. Just what has unfolded has really been a tough situation. <laughs> I am eager to take a flight and come in. I promise I'll definitely would love to spend time with the Institute. What you all do is very dear to my heart. You know, malaria is something that we have worked on for a very long while. And I think it's just for us, what's most important is being able to share these tools. So if any of you have interest, you know, the, and again, for many of the young students who might have connected, you know, the biggest thing you can do is often really get started because, uh, you know, it's one thing to meet a scientist. It's another thing to meet a scientist through their work. So, you know, go find fold scopes and play and teach a kid uh, what it means. And that would mean a lot to me. And you would have met me through the kinds of discoveries and tools that we have made. That really is the, uh, to me, that's really uh, uh, something that I get very excited about. I, I directly talk to many full scope community members. Uh, I spend a lot of time on community building on that front and it's just such a joy. So I think the easiest way to join the network is if you just go to microcosmos.fullscope.com you can find thousands and thousands of community members all across the world. And we have delightful scientific conversations all the time. All kinds of crazy ideas are brewed on that site, primarily driven by observations we all make through a full scope. But yeah, when I, when I come, I'll definitely run some workshops if people are excited. Okay, with this, uh, I think, uh... Uh, we should close the session now. And thank you very much, Manu, for spending your valuable time, especially it's a Sunday night for you. <laughs> thank you no, very much. And we would love to post here in the NMR whenever you are here. Just let uh, us know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, spend some time and really looking forward to the future. And Thank you. I have much. to now sleep because the kids will wake up uh, early morning. So, you know, right. uh, <laughs> bye. Thank everyone. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye.